Well, hello. It is good to see everybody. And as I often do, I want to just start by welcoming our different campuses. Kenosha, I got to tell you, I miss you. I know I haven't been around much on Sunday mornings. I've been hanging out with our Racine campus, and that's been fun for me. But I want to say, I will be back. And uh, it's good to see you. For those of you at our Racine campus, hello, are online, and then our beautiful Weekends on Wednesday campus. Always good. I am not just saying this. By far the most energetic campus at Great Lakes Church right here on Wednesday evenings. Uh, So here's the deal. If you're just joining us, we're in a series that we've been in now for several weeks. We'll actually wrap it up next week. It's called I Hate Losing My, and then fill in the blank. And you can pretty much fill in the blank with anything because we hate losing, right? We hate losing time. We hate losing debates. We hate losing hope. We hate losing joy. We could just continue with I hate losing for a very long time because there's so many things we hate losing. And in fact, in a completely different category of losing, all of us would say we hate losing our stuff. Every single day, on average, we spend 10 minutes looking for lost stuff. I know that doesn't surprise you. All right, in a lifetime, we lose about $5,500 worth of stuff, which I'm sure you think price sounds a little bit uh, less than maybe what you would have imagined, but that's because this, a lot of the stuff we lose, we find. But $5,500 worth of stuff that we never find. All right, and of course, at the top of the list of things we lose would be Keys, yeah. How many lost your keys in the last month? You would say in the last month you, you've lost your keys. All right, how about cell phone? Anybody lose their cell phone in the last month? All right, this is, this is uh, unique, right? Uh, or this isn't all that unique. This is something we do. Now, this would be a little bit more than unique. Anybody lose anything really expensive in the last month, like your laptop? You completely mis- misplaced it. All right, there are different campuses. Uh, airports and train stations and places like that collect lost stuff all the time. And most of the stuff is picked up and people claim it, but there are certain items that have gone unclaimed for years. Uh, Like this violin from the 1700s. How do you lose a violin at an airport and not know it? All right, another item lost at airport that was never claimed, an entire suit of armor. How does that happen, right? I mean, all of us hate losing stuff. Well, today what we're going to talk about is something that by far, every one of us would raise our hand and say, yep, I would not want to be in that category. I want to talk about I hate losing my money. None of us like to be scammed. None of us like to think we got a deal and then found out later, "Uh uh-oh, I paid way more than I probably should have for that. Right? We hate losing money, whether it's through investments or through gambling or the fact we just misplaced it. Because for us... Money represents security, and it represents power, and it represents uh, freedom, it represents success. And so the job that I have today, the the responsibility that I have today is kind of challenging, because i got to stand up here, and i got to say with a big smile on my face, money can buy a lot of things, but it cannot buy ongoing happiness, right? It can buy temporary happiness. But it can't buy lasting happiness. It can't buy ongoing joy and contentment. And then, of course, your responsibility is to sit there and to say, oh, that's that's right. That's good. That's good. I'm going to write that down. Money can't buy ongoing happiness. But if we're honest, all of us somewhere in the deep, dark places of our hearts say, "Um, I'd like to have a shot at it. Right, just like, God, give me one shot at having a lot of money and see if it at least can fuel a little bit of happiness in my life. A couple years ago, country singer Chris Jansen came out with a hit song called Buy Me a Boat. And what I want to do is just read some of the lyrics to you. He said, I wish I had a rich uncle that kicked the bucket and that I was sitting on a pile like Warren Buffett. I know everybody says money can't buy happiness, But it could buy me a boat, and it could buy me a truck to pull it, and it could buy me a Yeti 110 iced down with some silver bullets. Now, a Yeti 110 is a top-of-the-line cooler that costs about 500 bucks. It's totally bear-proof. There's not a reason that we probably would ever need one, but, man, it would make us smile. Right? It would just make us feel like we've got something significant. And I think most of us uh, would say, hey, I resonate with the lyrics of Chris Jansen's song. Even though money may not buy me ongoing happiness... 
It certainly could buy me a lot of things, and it could make my life way, way better. And the good news is, that's what we're going to talk about today. How money can make our life better. Now, I'm going to start by just calling a time out here. I'm going to pause for a moment. Because if you are new to Great Lakes Church, or you are uh, maybe not a Jesus follower, you're not into this whole God thing or church thing, I am aware that this is a topic that you feel uncomfortable with having any pastor talk about. Okay, I get that. Like your sphincter right now. Just, ugh. Please tell me you are not talking about money. So here, I'm going to put you at ease. You don't need to get nervous. Okay? Because I'm not going to ask you to take a vow of poverty, and I'm not going to ask you to give everything away. As a matter of fact, I'm going to walk through some principles that we see in the Bible that whether or not you're a follower of Jesus, I'm telling you, if you apply, you will have a better future. Not just for yourself, but for your entire family. Because believe it or not, the ancient writings that make up our Bible talk a lot about money. In our Bible, there's roughly 500 verses on prayer. There's less than 500 verses on faith, but there are more than 2,000 verses on money and possessions. That's a lot of verses. And it could be a little overwhelming. But the good news for us is if you take everything that the authors of Scripture wrote about money, and you took everything that Jesus taught about money, and you were to just boil them down, they could be boiled down to two words. Generosity and wisdom. Everything the Bible teaches about money can be summarized with these two words. Generosity and wisdom. Generosity means I give without expecting anything in return. And the good news is, you don't have to be a Jesus follower to be a generous person. There's lots of people who are generous and they're not followers of Jesus. Wisdom means I make decisions today with tomorrow in mind. Okay, I think about the future. And again, you don't have to be a follower of Jesus to be wise with your money. But the reason that we're tackling this topic today is it's something every single human at some point wrestles with. And most of us, if we were to talk about it, our whole perspective of money would just be, I need more. Right? I don't have enough of it. And somewhere we think, you know, in, in, in the parts of our heart that we don't really get to all that often, that, hey, it, it, it might not bring ongoing happiness, but it'll bring me happiness for a while. And so we're always trying to get more of it. Right? Some of you might remember back in 2011, there was a 17-year-old high school student in China who wanted an iPad and uh, an iPhone so bad that he actually sold one of his kidneys for $3,500. Okay, and, and the way his parents even found out about it, it happened pretty quickly, is he got really, really sick. And so he told them, hey, here's what happened. And uh, a surgeon, and along with some of his cronies, ended up going to prison. Why would someone do that? Well, money has this, this draw, this, this lure, this, this gravitational pull in our life. In, in Naples, Florida right now, there is a man who has this, Entire business that he's built up out of scaring naughty children for a fee. Right? The things we'll do for money. Right? So parents can hire, this is a true story, they can hire Wrinkles the Clown to terrify their children. And he's got great reviews. Parents are like, man, I hired him. And the, you know, he popped up in my kid's window at night. And I told my kids, that's what happens when you are misbehaving. So as inappropriate as it seems, he says, he claims he gets 100 plus calls a day. Another guy, just for money, just being desperate, sold advertisements to different companies, and he actually tattooed their websites to his face. Okay, he became a human billboard. Well, now he regrets it. So now he's been trying to collect money to have them removed. As humans, we'll do almost anything for money because we want to find ongoing happiness. And if it's only temporary happiness, happiness, we want that too. And so let me just ask you a straightforward question. How much more money do you need in your life to be happy? Realistically, I'm not talking, well, $100 million. No, realistically, how much more money do you need? Because you might want to write that number down. And I promise you, that number will change. Because if we were in our teens and we were asked how much money would it take to make us happy we'd have an amount and then we'd get in our 20s or our 30s and here's what happens as our income adjusts or as our income changes and it goes up our lifestyle 
changes and goes up. And often our lifestyle exceeds our income. And then our income goes up again and our lifestyle adjusts accordingly. This is the reason why 3,000 years ago, King Solomon of Israel, he was the third king of Israel, he wrote these words. He says, those who love money will never have enough. How meaningless to think that wealth brings true happiness. Humans have been wrestling with this for thousands and thousands of years. This idea that there's a connection between money and happiness. And the truth is, there actually is a connection. And here it is. Managing money properly can bring ongoing happiness. Managing money properly can bring ongoing happiness. Because happiness is not about how much we have. Happiness is about learning to manage what we have. And every single one of us needs to learn how to manage money or money will end up managing us. And of course, this is where most Americans find themselves, right? We're drowning in debt. We're never satisfied. It just kind of feels like life is out of control, which is why the words that Jesus spoke on this topic a couple thousand years ago are still relevant, and they're still practical for every single one of us. Here's what he taught. He said, no one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. When it comes to serving a master in our life, and we have to choose between one or the other, it would make sense that that choice would be between God and Satan. Right? Between good and evil. But Jesus, in this context, says, listen, when it comes to your heart, the chief competitor for your focus, for your attention, for your love, is really going to be between God and money. He said, you cannot serve God with all of your heart and be enslaved to money. Now, that doesn't really bother us to hear that because all of us would say, well, that's great because I'm not enslaved to money. And so what I want to do is bring a little bit of clarity of what it means to be a slave to money. Whenever we buy something we don't really need with money we don't have at the time, we are a slave to money. Whenever we do something a little unethical, right, we lie about our kid's age to get them in the movie because we want to save a little bit of money, we're slaves to money. Whenever we neglect the people we love the most and we spend way more time than we should trying to acquire more and more money that we're not in desperate need of, we're slaves to money. Whenever we look at our life and the people around us and we find it difficult to share with them and to be open-handed, we are, in, we are controlled by money. And Jesus says, here's the deal. You can't have two masters in life. You are going to be devoted to only one. To be devoted means I'm focused on this. Maybe I'm even obsessed with it. My heart is in this direction. This is what I think about. This is what I want. This is what I desire. And Jesus said, your heart will really only be devoted to one thing. Now let me ask you this question. Have you ever in your life ever had a desire for someone or something that brought you a lot of trouble? Have you ever had a desire for someone or something that ever caused you to do something stupid? And the answer, of course, is yes, because when our desires get out of control, we all do stupid things. We become a slave to our desire. Why did three very talented athletes from UCLA recently risk their entire career to steal stuff from high-end stores in China that, quite honestly, they didn't really need? Part of it's, ah, they're young, they're irresponsible, they're naive, they didn't realize the consequences and how se severe they could be. But a lot of it's because their desires got out of control. They wanted to have something. And Jesus said that can happen to any of us. He said if you're not careful... You will become slaves to money. Your focus, your obsession, your heart will be consumed by what's in your bank account. Now, if what Jesus said is true, it would be wise for all of us to step back and learn how to manage money so that it does not manage us. And so I want to spend the rest of the time we have together walking through three specific ways 
that we can learn to manage money well. And it's not going to be overwhelming, and it's not going to be you leave here saying, whoa, the wisdom that Dave shared with us today, it was just so overwhelming. This is going to be reminders to you, and there's going to be stuff that you have to step back and ask yourself, as simple as that may be, am I doing that in my life? Number one, if I want to manage money well, I must become aware of how much I have. Do you really know how much you have? Whenever you move, you quickly become aware of it. You're like, what in the world? I didn't realize it would take this long. Here's the deal. I often don't have a clue of how much I have, but I am certainly aware of how much I don't have. Okay, awareness is a very powerful dynamic. And I'm constantly aware of what I don't have, and that's why I feel poor. I feel like I lack. Our culture does an amazing job of making sure we know what we do not have. Our culture does an amazing job of always letting us know there's an upgrade. There's something faster and shinier and bigger and newer. There's something nicer. I have three tape measures. No, no exaggeration. I have three tape I don't need three tape measures, but I own three tape measures. Yesterday morning, I am watching the news, and there's commercials that come on, and one of the commercials was for the Measure King, the only tape measure you're ever going to need. I am not lying to you when I say I spent the next 10 to 15 minutes researching this thing. I ended up putting it in, my, uh, in a cart, and I, I was that close to buying it, and then it just hit me. Why am I doing this? I don't need another tape measure. But it takes about 30 seconds for all of us to go from, I didn't even know that existed, to, I can't live without it. Right? And it's awareness of what we don't have that fuels the lack of contentment in our life. It is a very powerful dynamic. And here's the cool thing. It can work for me or it can work against me. Here's the deal. If I can train myself to become aware of how much I really have, and I can train myself to realize, man, I am so incredibly blessed, it can fuel gratitude and contentment in my life. I mean, let me just ask you a quick question. Who is more content, a millionaire or someone with four kids? The answer is someone with four kids because they definitely don't want any more, right? They're totally content. They're like, hey, I'm good to go. And the thing about money is we always want more. Now, any time that we talk about money at Great Lakes Church, which is just two or three times a year, I always point uh, everybody, to a website that I find to be incredibly fascinating called globalrichlist.com. The reason I love this website is it's very simple, uh, but it really does open our eyes to how wealthy we are. Almost 50% of our world lives on less than $2.50 a day. Okay? You can fit 11 average size homes in China into one average size home in the United States. And China has a decent economy, right? I've been to Haiti a few different times, and I can tell you this is definitely what an average home in Haiti looks like. But, of course, that's not at the top of my mind during Christmas season. It's not at the top of my mind at Black Friday. All I'm aware of is what I don't have. If you make $25,000 a year or more, you are in the top 3% of the world's wealthiest people. I know you don't feel wealthy. Hey, neither do I. But you're in the top... 3%. If you make $50,000 a year or more, you're in the top 1% of the world's wealthiest people. So here's the deal. If you went and watched a movie at a movie theater this past month, you are rich. If you bought candy at the theater, you're filthy rich (laughs) and irresponsible. If you bought coffee at a coffee shop, you're rich. If you own a car, less than 10% of our world owns a car, you're rich. If you have different outfits based on different seasons, you're rich. If you have drinking water at your home, if you use water to make your grass green, you're rich. If you ever traded in a perfectly good working item for another perfectly good working item, you're rich. You have access. And here's the deal. You shouldn't feel guilty, nor should I feel guilty, because we are rich. We did not choose to be born in the United States of America or you know, for most of us. Most of us were born here. We didn't choose to be born at this time in history. Okay, we didn't choose what our talents and our giftings were. 
Every good and perfect gift is from above. We should feel incredibly blessed and incredibly responsible. Jesus, in one of his teachings, said when someone has been given much, much will be required in return. Another way to put it is to whom much is given, much is required. And the fact that we live in America in 2017, much has been given to us. And so when we hear that much will be required of us, it just means we have to be responsible. We have to be careful with how we manage the resources God's trusted us with so we do not waste them. So here's the deal. If I do not train myself to see the excess that I have in my life, I'm always going to have this poverty mentality. I'm always going to feel like I'm lacking. I'm always going to feel like I'm without. I'm going to talk to people all the time about what I do not have. Okay, so number one, if I want to manage money well, I must, I must become aware of how much I have. Now, if I learn to do that, number two is actually going to come quite naturally. Number two, if I want to manage money well, I must tame my desire for more. Now, don't mishear what I'm saying. Wanting more stuff is not wrong. This afternoon, I'm literally brushing up on my talk. I'm I'm putting the, the final details together. And I see an email come in from my son really randomly. My son never emails me, but he sent me an email. And it was his Christmas list. Of all the things he wants for 2017 Christmas. Hundreds of dollars worth of stuff. And he saved me time. He linked me right to it. I just deleted it. Here's the deal. Wanting stuff is not wrong. Desire is not wrong. But desire without discipline is going to lead to regret. Desire without discipline leads to debt. It leads to greed. It leads to lack of gratitude. So when it comes to stuff, all of us are going to end up falling into one of two categories. I want or I owe. I want, there's nothing wrong with that, saying, hey, I I want this. I can be content and still want something. I can have money in my bank account and still want something. I can have margin in my life. I can have peace in my life and still want something. But the moment I start to owe someone something because I don't have the money and I just go out and go for it anyways, man, it creates this anxiety and restlessness. I lack peace. And so if I'm going to learn to manage money well, I have got to learn to tame my desire for more. I want's always going to be better than I owe. Country singer Chris Jansen, when he wrote his hit song, he actually did buy a boat, but he bought something he could afford. He bought a kayak. This is a true story. He says, he says I don't know where my career is going, so I'm going to get some kayaks here for my family. Some of the happiest people on this planet are individuals who don't have a crazy excess of resources and money. They're just individuals who've learned to manage their money in a responsible way. And so if I want to manage my money well, I need to become uh, aware of of how much I have, right? I need need to just increase my capacity to just really be aware of that. Then then number two, I need to, um, after I become aware of it, I need to tame my desires for more and say, hey, I don't need everything that I want. I can can say no to stuff. But, But number three, at some level, I must have a plan. Okay, I must have some sort of budget. Because money flows in two directions. It flows toward me. That's a good thing, right? That's called income. And it flows away from me. And it's not a bad thing. That's just a reality. That's my expenses. However, if more is flowing away from me than it's flowing to me, we've got a problem. That's why King Solomon of Israel, he writes these words of wisdom on managing wealth. He says, do your planning and prepare your fields before building your house. Now, in the ancient world, a field was an asset. Okay, a house was a liability. Fields and animals typically produced income. Houses were money pits. And so the idea that Solomon is trying to convey is, listen, figure out your income. Figure out what your fields and your animals, figure out what, what, do you have enough to do the project? Plan it, think about it, so you'll know how to build your house. Back in the early 2000s, the Chinese government invested a billion dollars into creating a community in Inner Mongolia for a million people. 
And they did this in an area that was rich with natural resources. People were becoming incredibly wealthy in just a very short amount of time. And so uh, the Chinese government had every reason to believe this was going to be a huge success. But the taxes were too high. The quality of the buildings was subpar. And so people didn't end up moving into the city of Ordos like they thought. And it's pretty much a ghost town. Uh, China had to scale back dramatically. Uh, it's a community now that's set for a half million people, but only a third of that is, is actually filled with people, just over 100,000. Solomon says, when it comes to money, have a plan, be responsible. Everyone in the human race falls into one of two categories financially, hippies or nerds. All right, the nerds are the number of people. <laughs> you know, the people who love Excel and just say, I'm going to watch every single dollar. And the hippies, of course, are the people who just go through life like, oh, that looks great. Oh, let's just have a good time and enjoy it. And as a rule of thumb, hippies end up marrying nerds. Okay? When it comes to financially, it's just the reality. It's not going to shock you, right? I'm the nerd in my family, like the numbers, try to keep everything. My wife's the hippie. All right, if it wasn't for me, I promise you, she would be living in a van down by the river. Now, if it wasn't for her, I'd never have any fun in life. I'd never loosen up. So we need each other. So my question is, do you have a realistic budget that you live on? Leadership guru John Maxwell said a budget is telling your money where to go instead of wondering where it went. So you can create a budget online. You can do it with just paper and, and pen. You can, you can create a budget just using envelopes. In fact, my wife and I, that's how we've done it ever since we were married. We just have a bunch of envelopes and we... We divide uh, what the income is, and we put them between the envelopes. But I'm telling you, without a budget, without a plan, you're going to end up wasting and being irresponsible. Even if you're pretty good at saying, well, we don't go into debt. I'm telling you, without a budget, without a plan, you end up wasting more than you think you would. To whom much is given, much is required. So let me give you the, the basics for a budget, and then, then we'll wrap up here. Okay? For any budget, whether you're a follower of Jesus or not, there are three simple categories. We talk about them, uh, again, a couple times a year around here. Pretty simple. Give, save, live on the rest. Give, save, live on the rest. So let's talk about give. Okay? I don't have to be a follower of Jesus to be generous. I've already said that. Plenty of people in our world are generous, and they do not follow Jesus. And I would say, if that's the boat you're in, be a person who, whenever you get paid, gives to charity. Be a person who, every time you get paid, says, man, I'm going to prioritize something other than myself because it just, it does something in your heart. Now, for followers of Jesus, I'd say we don't really have an option on this because we were made in the image of a generous God. We follow a generous God. In fact, the most famous verse in all the Bible is, God so loved the world that he gave. And part of just becoming a generous person means I'm taking the step and I recognize that everything I have, my talent, my, uh, my income, my, my job, my personality, all of that is a gift from God. Everything I have comes from him. It's pretty much on loan for about 50, 75, maybe 100 years if I'm lucky. All right? Most of the stuff I own, I have, my house, right, my vehicles. Someone else had it before I did and someone else will have it afterwards. It's just the reality. And that's why I love the prayer of King David when the Jewish people gave extravagantly to the building of the temple. Because he prayed after everybody brought just incredible amounts of resources. And this was the, the core of his prayer. He said, wealth and honor come from you alone. For you, God, rule over everything. Power and might are in your hand. And at your discretion, people are made great and given strength. Oh, our God, we thank you. And praise your glorious name. But who am I? And who are my people that we could give anything to you? Everything we have has come from you, and we give you only what you first gave us. What an amazing attitude. Do not fall into the trap of thinking all the money you have is because of how smart you are and because of how hard of a worker you are and how God gave you the energy. He gave you the opportunities. Did the same for me. And one of the great ways we become generous is saying, yep, it's all from God. Now, the Jewish people, they built into their culture a, a pattern of giving back 10%. It was called the tithe. They would actually give a tithe. And people have asked me over the years, well, do you believe in tithing? Because I don't feel like tithing. I say, Here, here's what I would say. Don't do anything you don't want to do. Don't do anything without a heart of gratitude and generosity. 
Now, everyone on staff at Great Lakes Church does tithe. Everyone at staff at Great Lakes Church does give a minimum of 10%. But I'm going to tell you, what you do is between you and God. My challenge to you is to develop this habit of giving regularly and consistently. It may be you start with 1%, but regularly and consistently back to the work of God because of what it does in your heart. God doesn't need your money. He doesn't need my money. But every time we get paid, we can look at our money and say, money, you are not my boss. You are not the boss of me. Right? I'm your boss. God's your boss. And so I'm going to prove that by giving some of it away. And again, if, if, if you're not a church person, you're not a Jesus person, do it to charity. If you are a follower of Jesus, I do encourage you, give to your church. If this isn't your church, give to the church that you regularly attend. Because the church is the hands and feet of Jesus in the community. And if you say, well, I, I look at the church and I don't see how we're being the hands and feet. And I don't think we're doing enough mission work. Then find a church that you believe is doing that. Because that is how the work of Jesus moves forward. So the first part of a budget is to simply give. That amount is between you and God. But don't let it be nothing. If, if it has to be a dollar, let it be a dollar. But start somewhere. All right? And here's the thing about giving. Giving equals joy. As I give, I realize, man, joy is built. Joy is internal. Right? It's, it's ongoing contentment. It's tapping into to God's spirit. Debt doesn't equal joy. Right? Greed doesn't equal joy. Giving does. Now, I make a lot of fun of my kids when I talk. Right? I share crazy stories and things they do and ridiculous things, especially my 18-year-old Caitlin. You know, some of her stuff and some of the stuff she'll pull, and I love to just give them a hard time. And they, they're always cool when I share the stories because I ask them ahead of time. Uh, I didn't ask Caitlin this, but I'm going to tell you, I'm incredibly proud of my daughter, Caitlin, when it comes to this area of generosity. Because at 18 years old, I have watched her develop this habit in her life. Over the last couple of years, she has taken her income from Texas Roadhouse and she has fueled the mission of this church by being faithful in her giving. I've watched her give to people in just little gifts here and there. I'm like, man, if I could reproduce this heart, everybody. She actually babysat for someone a couple years ago and they called afterwards and says, hey, she babysat and the next day she came by and, and brought Starbucks for my kid and left it in the fridge because it wasn't there. I'm like, man, if I could just get that heart, because here's the deal. Why does she do that? Because it brings joy. It doesn't make her feel discouraged or defeated. And I think the reason that giving is such a challenge for, for all of us, at least in the beginning stage, is because there's so much fear attached, fear of our future and fear of, you know, am I going to have enough retirement and fear, fear, fear. And I think that's why God loves to say, hey, just trust me. Step out. See if this doesn't do something and build something in your life. Now, it's been easy for me because ever since I had a job at 13, 14 years old, and my parents say, for every $10 you get, give one back to God. And, I, you know, it's just a habit. So I've never really thought about it, but I know that is not the case for so many of you. That's not been the habit. So start somewhere and develop this habit of generosity. After you give, save. Experts say that we ought to be saving 10 to 15% of our income every single year. Uh-oh. Right? Hey, I get it. Overwhelming. But again, start somewhere. If you say, well, I can't afford to do that, I, I agree. Most of us can't afford to do that and maintain our current lifestyle. But here's the deal, and you know this is true. When we have money in the bank, we have peace of mind. Because that's what saving does. Saving equals peace. It brings some sort of, of just stability in our hearts. So if you want peace in your life, develop a budget in which you learn to give first, and then you save. And again, save somewhere. If you're like, I don't know where to start, save a dollar, but save somewhere. The wise have wealth and luxury, but fools spend whatever they get. That's what King Solomon wrote. That's a wise saying about money. Now again, if you want to save, you're probably going to have to adjust your lifestyle just like I do. But this is how we manage money. And then finally... After we give and we save, we can live on the rest. Okay, if you want to manage your money wisely and you want to be responsible with it, after you've given and saved, now you start to learn to live on the rest. This is where you pay your bills. Again, King Solomon, he wrote so many of these sayings on money. He says, know the state of your flocks and put your heart into caring for your herds, for riches don't last forever. Okay, when Solomon wrote these words, wealth was attached to the fields, it was attached to animals, Solomon says, hey, know how much you have and be responsible with it. But here's what he doesn't say. He doesn't say give it all away. 
And he doesn't say hoard it all and save it all. No. He just says know it and be responsible with it. Here's the deal. When it comes to money, it's supposed to be used. It's supposed to be enjoyed. It's not supposed to be stockpiled. Money is a tool. And if we learn to give and to save, we will find freedom in learning how to live on the rest. Living on the rest equals freedom. Living on the rest says, man, I'm able to work within the boundaries of something. And so there is a connection between happiness and money, but it's not more. It's managing what we have. Now, in another part of the book of Proverbs, King Lemuel writes about a woman who's praised for her character and generosity and financial wisdom. Here's what the king writes. He says, she goes to inspect a field and buys it. With her earnings, she plants a vineyard. Then she extends a helping hand to the poor and opens her arms to the needy. She's clothed with strength and dignity, and she laughs without fear of the future. She approaches finances with wisdom and generosity, and then I love this phrase that he uses. She laughs without fear of the future. I mean, wouldn't that just be an amazing way to live? Well, if we're ever going to get there, we have to do a couple key things. We have to become aware of how much we have. we got to tame our desire for more, and then we got to live on some sort of budget. And if you say, I don't know where to start, you literally can just go to the homepage, greatlakeschurch.com, click on current series, and we put resources for you. A few years ago, we did a debt challenge here. In one year, collectively, the people of our church, it was more than a million and a half dollars in debt that we eliminated. Put those resources on there for you. Right? There's a financial page on our, uh, our, our site that I link you to right there in the current series. So you go greatlakeschurch.com, click on the current series, and start somewhere. The big idea for the whole series has simply been this. People who win know when to lose. You want to win financially, you're going to have to lose at some things. You're going to have to say, nope. I know people in this church who literally have sold homes and downgraded to townhouses, some to condos, some to apartments, because they needed to get their financials, finances in order. I know people who've sold cars and they've downgraded what they drive. Sometimes we have to say no if we're going to win. So where do you need to grow the most financially? Is it in your generosity? Or is it in your wisdom? Maybe it's both. But start somewhere in taking that next step. And again, those resources are on, on the website so you can begin moving in that direction. Now next week, we're going to wrap up this series and we're going to talk about I hate losing my relationships. And we're going to specifically talk about uh, husband-wife relationships significant other relationships. And the reason why we're going to do that is because I know you need it. And my wife needs it. So <laughs> next week we are going to do that and I hope you can join us. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would help us with this very emotional, emotional issue of trying to manage money. You would help us to do it in a responsible way and in a way that honors you. Help us all to learn what it looks like to give, save, live on the rest. In Jesus' name, amen.